G'day everyone, welcome to another episode of It's All Happening at Utah's live stream. I'm Dr. Jamie Chapman, this is Dr. James Crane. Hi everyone. Um, today we're going to be talking about, well James is going to be talking about metabolic rate and thermoregulation. So thanks very much for coming along. Don't forget your involvement is really important so if you can uh, ask your questions in the chat or let us know you're around, it really helps us know that um, you're participating and if someone's here we're not just talking to the void. Um, so Sri Lanka man, thanks very much for um, giving us the little smiley face. It's good to know that someone's here. Um, so um, I'm going to hand you over to James. I'm going to have to pop out a little bit early, but I can leave you in James's capable hands and I'll be checking the chat for a little while. Um, so please be nice. Okay. okay. Hi everyone. Good to see uh, Sri Lanka man here and I'm sure there's uh, looks like there's a couple other people floating around in the background lurking away. So. Right, so what we thought we would talk about today is we'd go through uh, metabolic rate and particularly sort of looking at differences between, I guess, anabolic uh, systems or anabolic um, processes and catabolic processes, right? So um, what happens when we have a meal and when we need to sort of uh, store that energy, bring that energy into storage sites and make sure that's available for use later on and then you know how do we then retrieve that energy uh, to make use of that so that we can go into things like cellular respiration right so hopefully by now um, oh maybe not right I don't know who I'm talking to so one of the things that I guess we can talk about when we're talking about a cell Sorry. and I have my little pen here and I need to just maybe do that all right excellent okay so all right so what we know is that cells need energy okay so all cells need energy to drive their functions. And inside the cell, the primary currency of energy, the, the thing that it uses to sort of trade with other proteins or that proteins uses to do work is a molecule called adenosine triphosphate. And so where are we going to get that adenosine triphosphate from? So that's not a substance that we can ingest, right? So we can't just eat adenosine triphosphate and have that go into cells and then use that for energy. Um, what we need to do is actually make that substance. So the reason adenosine triphosphate has the ability to use, we can use that as energy is it's actually in the name. So we have this adenosine molecule, which is um, a larger sort of organic molecule. And then we have three phosphate groups that are attached to that. And each one of these chemical bonds here right, is a storage site for energy. So really what we have in here is chemical potential energy. So there's energy stored inside those bonds. When we're in this adenosine triphosphate molecule, we have the sort of maximum amount of energy that can be stored by this, this particular molecule here. If we then break one of these bonds, so if I take this process and I break this bond off and I release that phosphate group, what comes out of that breaking of that phosphate bond there is energy. So we have a high energy chemical bond here and this energy that's released can be used to drive functions inside the cell and to make change, proteins change their configuration uh, and that will drive pumps that will move things across the membrane it will do a whole range of other things inside the cell. And so when this energy has been released, what we end up with is a molecule called adenosine diphosphate. And while you can potentially also strip that down to adenosine monophosphate, and get a bit more energy off it, we tend to hold on to these uh, phosphate groups with a bit more strength. So these bonds here are a little bit higher energy. They take a little bit more to break. So more often than not, what we end up doing is recycling that adenosine diphosphate back into adenosine triphosphate. And we have metabolic pathways inside cells that lay, enable us to do that, to continually regenerate this adenosine triphosphate. 
So if we're looking at how do we go about making ATP, adenosine triphosphate, inside cells. So there's, there's two primary mechanisms that we talk about, and one of them actually leads into the other one. So the, the, one, the first one that we have here um, is what we call anaerobic anaerobic cellular respiration. And what this is, is, you know, the, the process, the cellular process is called glycolysis or glycolysis, right? So if you look at this, we have glyco, which is the prefix that we see when we're talking about glucose. We're going to see this quite a lot. We're going to be talking about other molecules called glycogen, which is a polymer of glucose. So this is this is basically glucose, a, a, a prefix that sort of represents a glucose uh, molecule or that we're talking about glucose. And lysis, hopefully you understand, means breaking apart. You know, we can lyse cells. So this glycolysis literally means breaking apart of sugar, breaking apart of glucose. And so this glycolysis pathway produces two molecules of adenosine triphosphate per molecule of glucose. Now that's, that's okay, but that's not really a huge amount of energy from a molecule of glucose. What we get out of that is a byproduct called pyruvate. Now, when things are going really, really well and we have lots of oxygen available to the cell, this pyruvate moves into another system and a, and a larger system that involves things like the TCA cycle and the electron transport train, which are a little bit um, beyond certainly the first year subject that we're directing this to mostly, but also, to be perfectly honest, a little bit beyond my expertise as well. Um, so we'll just call this aerobic cellular respiration. And so aerobic means, you know, that's hopefully, you know, you've started to get this idea, aero, aero means air, so aerobic cellular respiration. Basically, this is a type of cellular respiration that requires oxygen. And so pyruvate gets, enters into this aerobic cellular res respiration process. And the output of that is about maximally, not always, but you know, if things are working really, really well, the maximum output that we can get out of that are 34 molecules of ATP. So together, using aerobic cellular respiration and anaerobic cellular respiration, we can get a total, a maximum total of 36 molecules of ATP from a single molecule of glucose. And so that's, that's a really good amount that's going to allow us to drive a lot of cellular functions. Um, this becomes a really important point, actually, that you know, there's big difference between what we, the amount of energy we produce when we're dealing in, in, a, in an oxygen low environment versus the amount of energy that we can produce in an oxygen high environment. The one reason, and as someone that does a lot of neuroscience work, one of the reasons I find this particularly interesting is that you know it explains very much why you know we can't um, hold our breath for 15, 20, 30 minutes and still continue to function. And that's because our neurons, our brains, uh, and the neurons inside our brains have a really high demand for adenosine triphosphate. So um, something in the order of 30 to 40 percent of the energy. Um, that you actually use is actually taken up by maintaining brain function and neural function. And they have a really high demand for adenosine triphosphate, particularly to run protein, uh, sorry, uh, ion pumps. So the sodium potassium pump in particularly, that allows us to maintain electrochemical gradients um, across the cell membrane that allows neurons to fire action potentials and to signal to each other. And so the only way that neurons can get this information or to get this amount of ATP is really through that aerobic cellular respiration process. If they are just relying on anaerobic cellular respiration, there's not enough ATP and neural function is compromised severely and that's, you know, eventually will lead to death and damage to those neurons and eventually death and damage to the organism. So what we're going to talk about really um, if we sort of start talking about, um, I guess, metabolic rate and how it is that we're sort of looking at the metabolism and how we regulate metabolism and how that changes from, say, what would occur just after a meal versus what would occur, um, say, three or four hours after a meal or in the hours following that meal. Um, 
we're going to be talking about the substances that can be used and gener that can be harnessed by cells in order to produce its adenosine triphosphate. So we've already talked about one of these. We've talked about glucose can go in. We've mentioned that if there's oxygen around the pyruvate, will get cycled into this aerobic cellular respiration process. Now, if there's no oxygen, this pyruvate will get turned into lactate, which will get released from the cells, uh, go into the bloodstream and, you know, as lactic acid. And um, that eventually makes its way to the liver, where the liver can, through a process called gluconeogenesis, um, convert that back into glucose. Um, but there are other things that we can use in aerobic cellular respiration. We can use fatty acids and we can use protein. So let's, let's have a bit of a look here. I have a couple of things that might help us here. Hopefully that's clear enough on the screen. If I make it too big, it gets a little bit blurry. Okay, so this is what we're looking at here. So this cycle inside here, let's see if I can change my pen color. Excellent, we've got a red on. All right, so this is our TCA cycle. Um, we can see this is our pyruvate up here, all right, and this is our TCA cycle. So from here down to basically here, right, that's what we were talking about with our aerobic cellular respiration. And this glycolysis here is our anaerobic component of this cellular respiration process. Okay, so let's have a look. Let's just start with glucose. Where, what's actually going to happen here? So we have a nice meal of glucose. Um, we have uh, some insulin that's released and that's going to encourage the uptake of glucose, right? So while we will see an increase in blood glucose, the cells in your body don't, aren't, aren't able to use all of the glucose that's come in through a meal. So what we want to do is we want to store that energy, you know, uh, as we were traveling through the savannah and, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, food and energy was inconsistent. You know, unfortunately, we, or fortunately, uh, we have, you know, almost unlimited supply and continuous access to nutrients and food, certainly in Western countries here. But, you know, that hasn't always been the case. And it's actually a fairly rare thing and it's a fairly new thing. So what we needed to do is we needed to evolve a system to maintain our long-term supply of energy through the body. And the way we did that is we, we developed a system to store excess energy, the energy that had come in through um, ingestion of food that we weren't able to use immediately could be stored. Okay, so what's going to happen here? Well, let's talk about some energy that's actually going to be used. And we did mention this. So we have the glucose coming in and insulin's going to cause some of that uh, glucose to go inside the cells. Um, and if we follow the red pathway, it's going to go down through glycolysis, that pyruvate, if there's oxygen available, is then going to enter the TCA cycle. And we're going to end up with our, you know, maybe our subtotal of 36 molecules of ATP coming out. Okay, but what if we have we've don't need as much of that glucose, right? So if, if we've got as enough ATP being produced, how are we going to uh, store that? Well, one of the things that can happen is inside the liver particularly, we have the ability to take this glucose, this glucose which goes into this glucose 6-phosphate, and then cycle it back up into glycogen. So we have this process called glycogenesis, right? So genesis is making, formation. Glyco uh, is going to be sort of, again, sort of, glucose molecule or glucose polymer sort of related prefix. So glycogen is a polymer of glucose molecules. And so this becomes a storage molecule for us to store extra glucose inside the liver. All right. And so that can stay there until such time as blood glucose levels drop. Um, and we might release some glucagon, for instance, uh, and that will encourage us to reverse this process. And so we've got the glycogen here inside the liver. Now we want to sort of release the glucose molecules to allow those to enter into these cycles so that we can produce our ATP. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through this price process called glycogenolysis. So, right, so we're going to be glycogenolysis. So the ly lysis or breakdown of glycogen. And that will get us back to our glucose 6 molecule. 
uh, glucose 6-phosphate molecule which will be able to enter into this cycle to produce our adenosine triphosphate for the cells. So very simply, just looking at glucose, we have the ability through glycogen to take any excess glucose that we have and put that into a storage site so that we can use that at a later date. What this allows us to do is to normalize and to sort of hopefully flatten out to a larger degree the blood glucose levels inside of our body. So there is a, a principle that is called homeostasis. And so what that means is that the, the body acts in, in many, many different ways to maintain body systems and, and measurements and values that are important to the body within normal ranges. So we have this normal range like so, so this might be the upper limit, this is the lower limit. And so blood glucose is going to hopefully, in a perfect situation, oscillate between those normal ranges. What we don't want to see is excessively high blood glucose, and we don't want to see excessively low blood glucose. And so things like this cycle between glucose and glycogen, this sort of bidirectional pathway between glucose and glycogen, is probably not the best way to do it because it's actually between glucose and glucose 6-phosphate. So this bidirectional pathway here is going to be one way that we can maintain our blood glucose levels and try to normalize and maintain that homeostatic blood glucose level. So what happens though if we're running low on glucose? So what happens if our blood glucose levels are low and we've depleted our uh, liver stores and our glycogen stores of glucose? Well. The, the issue becomes that the neurons and the brain really have an absolute requirement for glucose. So glucose is pretty much the only molecule that they can use to generate their ATP. So we're going to see a preferential dis delivery and a preferential use of glucose by the neurons. And that's going to mean that the other tissues and other cells in the body are going to have to look at using a different source of energy, right? So a different type of organic molecule that has energy wrapped up and tied up inside of its chemical bonds and somehow use that to get access to the, uh, and use that to generate its adenosine triphosphate, right? So because the brain really can only use glucose, we see the other tissues and cells in the body start to use, in low glucose situations, start to use some other molecules. And so the, really the, the molecules that it has access to that it can use are proteins and fats. Okay, so fats or triglycerides. So let's talk about the fat side of things first, right? So in a situation where we have low glucose levels, uh, our storage levels have been depleted, and we need to continue to generate ATP, uh, we will start to use fats. So again, let's look at how we might use that, and then we'll talk about you know, this storage type situation here. So if we look at our fats, our triglycerides, you know, we have this stored in adipocytes uh, throughout the body. There are lots of different places that you know, we know we're storing our fat. I've certainly got my, uh, my uh, my supplies ready for the next Armageddon, um, making sure that I'm well and truly ready for, uh, for the starvation event. So we've got our fats sitting inside of our cells. So what we can do is we can go through lipolysis, right? So we can break down those larger triglycerides, those larger poly polymers of fatty acids into the free fatty acids, releasing the glycerol backbone that those free fatty acids are stuck on, right? So those free fatty acids can then go through a process called fatty oxidation, um, and then they will get produced into this acetyl-CoA. Now this acetyl-CoA is actually a molecule that can be fed directly into that tricyclic acid cycle, this TCA cycle, and that can be used to generate these molecules of adenosine triphosphate. So we can get significant amounts of adenosine triphosphate from the acetyl-CoA, which is produced by the oxidation of those free fatty acids. So this means that we have the ability to use fats and triglycerides to generate adenosine triphosphate. Okay, so part of the uh, issue associated with this though, is that a byproduct of this and a, and a, and a, subs, a, yeah, a byproduct of this is 
um, as we get a buildup of this acetyl-CoA is that we get this ketogenesis and we produce these things called ketone bodies. Now, in a normal situation, that's okay. We're able to deal with those ketone bodies, but they are acidic and they will cause acidification of the bloodstream. Um, and they do cause some really, in high levels, they can cause some really toxic events inside the central nervous system. They can cause significant damage to the brain. So is this lipid pathway the basis of the keto diet? Yes, it is. In fact, we were just sort of talking about that a little while ago, right? So, um, you know, probably the most famous of these keto diets is the Atkins diet. And so the idea was that you avoid as much of your carbohydrates as you possibly can. Um, you maintain a very low glucose and glycogen supply. And what that's going to do is, you know, theoretically, and you know, it's going to force you to be using fats instead of glucose. Okay, so, and look, you know, there's some validity to that, but, you know, we'll talk about in a little bit, the fact that unfortunately it's not quite as easy as that, right? This is not necessarily going to be the be all and end all of things. Partly because a byproduct that is the product of ketones and ketones can be toxic and can cause damage. And so you need to be very, very careful about how much ketogenesis you're going through. But then probably the other thing to keep in mind is let's look over here. It's not just fatty acids and fats that we'll start to use when we don't have enough glucose. We can actually start to use proteins, right? So we will see that we can go through proteolysis and we'll break down proteins to produce amino acids. And these amino acids, right, can then be used and broken down into pyruvate, which again can go into the TCA cycle to produce ATP, right? Or we could potentially go down into alpha ketoglutarate and a few of these other things, succinol-CoA and a few other different molecules that can also make their way into the TCA cycle to produce ATP. So we don't just use fatty acids when we have a low glucose, we also use proteins. Where is a fantastic source of protein? Muscles. Right, so muscles obviously filled with protein. So what you'll actually start to see is a breakdown of muscle tissue associated with a low glucose and a low, um, a low blood glucose level. Right, when you're actually trying to do uh, catabolic activities, when you're trying to produce energy and you don't have enough glucose, then you'll actually start to, yes, you'll start to break down fat, but you'll also break down protein. So this becomes a really interesting thing for bodybuilders, right? So especially you know, if we're looking at professional bodybuilders um, who are you know, in a situation where maybe just before a competition, they're trying desperately to reduce fat levels, but they also don't want to reduce their protein levels. So they need to be very, very careful about the proportions of the nutrients that they're actually intaking. Um, it is certainly, if you go to say, for instance, I know if you go to the Australian Institute of Sport website, and they, you know, you look at what they recommend, for instance, for a post-workout recovery drink, because it's known that after a vigorous, intense period of exercise, um, you need your blood glucose levels will have dropped because your muscles will have used a lot of glucose, and so in order to prevent your muscles and your cells from starting to break down protein, which is sort of counteractive to maybe doing all of those weights and all of that stuff that you were doing. What you want to do is have a meal within about 30 to 40 minutes that contains a significant amount of free glucose, right? And so they actually just recommend a nice bottle of chocolate milk is, is pretty much one of their, their primary recommendations. That's going to elevate blood glucose a lot high enough to sort of prevent you from breaking down proteins um, and to replenish the glycogen stores that you've, you've, you've uh, depleted during the exercise. So obviously, you know, there is this sort of bi-directional communication, bi-directional sort of processes that are going on. I want to point out one other thing here though, right? And I want to point out this pathway here, right? So I want to point out that we have this ability for glucose to go into glucose 6-phosphate. And then through this blue arrow, get converted into basically free fatty acids and glycerol, um, and then into triglycerides. Right, so what I'm wanting to point out here is that a high intake of glucose can also lead to 
the production of fat, right? So this is a major storage site inside the body. So we have the ability to take our glucose, this extra glucose that we've been eating, and feed that into fat stores, right? So that we can tap into that at a later date. So that becomes a long-term storage location uh, for the energy that we've ingested you know, beyond, say, a glycogen, which is a little bit more readily accessible. So what's the, what's the take-home message for that? Well, the take-home message for that is if you look at a lot of low-fat foods, right, yes, they have reduced significantly the amount of fat that's in that product, but um, because fat is flavor, it's just one of those things. Fat creates a lot of flavor. It's got a lot of um, molecules in there that our taste buds respond to in order to compensate for the lack of fat they've usually, and in many cases, have boosted significantly the amount of sugar inside that product. And so, you know, while yes, the amount of fat inside the product is reduced, the amount of sugar has increased. And so because we're still getting more sugar than we actually need, more energy than we actually need, we start to see a buildup of fat as well, right? So we don't actually lose any weight for it. Unfortunately, the simple, the simple message for all of this is that you know, there is a simple sum of the amount of energy that comes in minus the amount of energy that goes out um, and whatever's left over, we're going to try to store. And so if you're looking to lose weight, then you need to maximize the amount of energy that's going out and decrease the amount of energy that's come in to so make sure there's an energy deficit that we say. Um, but if you're looking to gain muscle, if you're an athlete looking to gain muscle, then you need to be looking at doing the opposite thing, right? You need to be making sure that you're energy that's coming in is higher than the energy that's going out, you know, but it has to be the right sort of energy and you need to be balancing all these things to ensure that we're stimulating muscle development and not just putting on a lot of extra fat here. Um, so hopefully Sri Lanka man, I hope that's how we pronounce it. Hopefully that's um, answered your question. Please uh, let me know if there's anything else I can help you with with that. Um, this sort of cycle is, um, is highly regulated by you know a lot of the hormones that are, are floating around inside the body. So as I said, insulin is going to stimulate significantly glucose uptake. So it, it inserts more glucose transporters into the cells, membranes, encourages glucose to be taken up into the liver and also into the muscle cells so that they can uh, use and store their energy levels. Um, we also have glucocorticoids, for instance, on the opposite side of things. So glucocorticoids are a primary stress hormone inside the body. So at times of stress, and you know, that's not necessarily psychological stress, it can be physical stress, it can be exercise stress. But in, in those periods of time, we're going to be causing glucocorticoids to be released, and they're going to stimulate glycogenolysis, and they're going to stimulate glycolysis, and they're going to stimulate the production of glucose and the feeding of that glucose into the anaerobic and aerobic cellular respiration pathways. So they're gonna be facilitating the, the burning of energy. As I said um, earlier, what we can also do is sometimes that pyruvate, if there isn't enough oxygen around, can come out of the cells, get converted into lactic acid. And then through a process of gluconeogenesis in the liver, it can be converted back into glucose, right? And then potentially from that glucose back into glycogen. So we have all of these nice little pathways and feedback loops in place that allows us to make use of and maximize the, the value of the food that we've been eating. And this really, again, comes back to the fact that energy supplies were very, very inconsistent. You know, you did not necessarily know when you were going to see the next significant amount of food and where the significant amount of energy was going to come from. And this was even more apparent and more prominent during winter periods of time when obviously crops and food is, is a lot scarcer. So the cells in the body have developed a whole collection of processes by which we can absorb take in this energy, store this energy, and then make use of that energy at a later date so that we can um, normalize our blood glucose levels and maintain this sort of homeostatic level as we go through. Okay, so um, I see, unfortunately, so Jamie's just had to step away, so that's, so it's just up to me, so you've got me now. So I guess the question that I have, and I, I don't know how many people are out there, is, um, 
please, if you've got any particular questions, if there's anything in particular that you would like me to talk about, um, I'll certainly do my best to try to unpack these things for you. Um, it's uh, it's a complicated process, and obviously, you know, we're touching on it at a very, uh, a fairly superficial and and I guess probably superficial is not the right word, but an entry level sort of le- um, level of detail. Um, if you were to go into seriously into uh, biochemistry, and if you were going to look more detailed at exercise physiology, then there'd be a lot more information that um, would be required and a lot more information that we could tell you. So in failing any particular questions or anything that might be brought up about this, the next thing we can talk about, which is part of this uh, section that everyone's been working on recently, is we can start talking about thermoregulation. Oh, let's just get rid of that. Okay. So thermoregulation. So this is again one of these um, homeostatic set points that we're talking about, right? So we kind of know, and you know, we know over time that the the temperature of the body likes to sit. You know, the normal temperature of the body oscillates between about 37.65 degrees Celsius, about 37.5 degrees Celsius. So we sort of, you know, it'll oscillate and it'll move around, but you know, it'll try to stay within that range. Obviously when things go beyond that, if we start talking about things like, you know, fevers, then, you know, we start talking about temperatures that have exceeded 37.5. And if we start talking about hypothermia, then we start looking at temperatures that have gone below 36.5. So the question I guess that we have to ask ourselves is, so how is it that we're going to maintain this homeostatic uh, level of temperature regulation? And this is actually more of an interesting question and it's more challenging than you may actually initially have thought it was going to be. Um, There are a lot of things that are impacting and, and impinging on the body that are going to cause a challenge to body temperature. I mean, it's not too hard to see how external forces are going to cause a significant challenge and can make a significant impact on your ability to main body, maintain body temperature. Um, you go out, stand in the snow um, in the middle of winter, obviously, um, with very little clothing on, and you're going to have a really significant challenge to your ability to maintain body temperature. The same thing will happen if you're in the middle of a desert in a 45 degree day with the sun beating down. You're going to have a significant impact and a significant challenge on your ability to maintain normal body temperature. But there's also internal factors that are going to affect your ability to maintain normal body temperature. So, uh, you know, we are constantly producing heat. So if you look at those metabolic pathways that we were just talking about, only about, um, what is it about? Uh, It has about a 40% efficiency rate, right? So about 40% of um, of the energy that goes into the system comes out as adenosine triphosphate or as energy that cells can actually use. About 60% of the energy that goes into the system um, comes out as heat, right? So those metabolic pathways are a really important way of generating heat inside cells and therefore inside tissues and inside the body. And they are an important part of maintaining our normal body temperature, right? So, you know, significant shifts in metabolic rate um, and in the breakdown of glucose and the production of ATP are also going to have a significant increase in heat production. And that's going to impact and challenge our ability to maintain normal body temperature. So how are we going to regulate that? So how are we going to, to first of all, detect those changes and then regulate those, that body temperature? So in order to understand that, we we do kind of need to go back to this sort of, I guess the reflex, well, it's not really reflex, sort of a homeostatic mechanisms, right? Homeostatic uh, responses, mechanisms, let's call it, that's probably a reflex, I guess. And it's probably not really a reflex. What are we going to call it? Homeostatic mechanisms. 
We'll just call it homeostasis. Okay, we'll just get rid of that there. Okay, so what is going to happen? So if we're looking at our temperature here, so if this is body temperature, and we uh, have the ability to detect a change in body temperature, so we'll have a receptor that's going to detect that change in body temperature. So we'll put a little triangle there, that means change. So change in body temperature. So that's going to be detected by a receptor. So that receptor in this case is going to be maybe a thermo, well, it will be a thermoreceptor, right? So that could be a thermoreceptor in the skin, it could be a thermoreceptor deep inside the body, but this is going to detect the change that's occurred in body temperature. That information will then be sent to a control center. So that information will be sent to a control center uh, in many instances, that control center is the brain. And in many instances, inside the brain, it's a region called the hypothalamus. And that's most definitely the case for temperature regulation. Okay, The temperature regulatory regions inside the brain are certainly located inside the hypothalamus. So what's that control center going to do? So the control center is going to look at that change in body temperature, is gonna look at what the current body temperature is, it's gonna compare that to a set point, right? So it turns out that a lot of these things that we need to maintain within homeostatic levels have a, almost a neurally encoded set point. So it has a, as a particular value or a particular range of values that the brain is trying to keep these, uh, this particular um, aspect of the body in, in between. So for instance, in temperature, we have that range of values of 36.5 to 37.5. So that becomes our set point. So the control center is gonna compare what the current temperature is against that set point. And if it differs significantly from that set point, then it's going to initiate a set of responses, right? So it will decide on what needs to be done and it will send out some messages to what we call an effector. Hopefully you can see that, yep, just check that, All right. Effector, or it might be effectors, right? In many instances it will be a number of different things. So if we're talking about temperature, if we're talking about changes in body temperature, what are those effectors likely to be? They're likely to be things like sweat glands, they're likely to be things like uh, metabolic rate, they're likely to be things like behavioral changes um, that will either allow us to increase our body temperature or decrease our body temperature. And we'll talk about some of those in just a little bit. So that those effectors are going to initiate a change, right? So they're going to hopefully initiate a change that lowers body temperature. And with any luck, if things have gone really well, then that change in body temperature will be detected by the thermoreceptor and we'll send that message to the control center. Sorry, I don't know why I put that cross there. Send that message to the control center. The control center will notice that everything's sort of back to where it was and the whole pathway will sort of settle down again. So we have this constant comparative loop that's going on that allows us to look at what the body temperature is and compare that against the set point and work out what we can do to actually change our body temperature to, to get it back within those normal values. So as I said, if we're looking at the control centers for body temperature, body temperature control centers. So those body temperature control centers um, are definitely in a region of the brain called the hypothalamus, right? So, um, I'll just write it, I was gonna draw it, but that's not gonna work. So a region of the brain called the hypothalamus. So there are actually two regions. So there is one that's going to be responsive to uh, a decrease in body temperature, right? And that's going to act to, when it's activated, it's gonna to act to increase body temp. And there's also another region of the hypothalamus that responds to a higher body temperature and that is going to act to initiate a set of responses that is going to decrease body temperature. So we can sort of pause here and talk a little bit about the role that the hypothalamus plays, not just in regulating normal body temperature, 
but also that the role that the hypothalamus plays in the initiation of fever. Right, so fever, I mean, I'm sure we've all had a fever. So we know that sometimes when you get sick, especially when you get um, uh, viral or bacterial infections, right, then you can get a fever, which is really a significant raising of the body temperature above normal values, right? So instead of it peaking at 37.5, you know, we might end up at 38.5, 39 maybe even 40, right? You know, and certainly we can go higher than that. But if we go if we go too higher than say 40 degrees, right? If we start getting up to say 42 degrees or higher, then we start to have really significant problems. And the reason being is that we start to see really significant changes in metabolism. We start to see really significant changes in the function of enzymes that are critical to cellular function. And we start to see denaturing of proteins. So some of these proteins uh, are very sensitive to temperature and any significant changes in, in body temperature are going to cause them to denature, to basically unravel. They'll, use, they'll lose their three-dimensional shape and they won't function as well. And so without those enzymes, the cells will cease to function as well and we'll start to see you know significant impacts across a lot of different organ systems. So I guess the question is then, so why do we get fevers like and, and what's the what's responsible for causing this fever well it actually has to do with the hypothalamus so the hypothalamus as we said sort of maintains this set point so it, it decides what the set point is that it's trying to keep body temperature within it turns out that when you get an infection and then you get an immune response Part of that immune response is the production of things like prostaglandins, um, also anaphylatoxins like complement factor C5A, which you don't really need to worry too much about at this point, but um, this is another substance that's released in response to an infection. And this circulates through the bloodstream. And these substances actually interact with the hypothalamus. And one of the things that they do is when they get into the temperature regions of the hypothalamus, they act to change the set point. So they actually cause the set point to become raised. So now the hypothalamus, instead of trying to keep body temperature at 37.5 as a maximum, will now decide that actually it's totally okay for it to get up to say 39 degrees as a maximum or 40 degrees. So we effectively are shifting the homeostatic maximum set point here so that we, um, and, and as a result, we, we see that and we feel that as a, as a fever, right? We see that as a significant elevation of our body temperature and particularly our core body temperature. So why would the body want to do that? What's the reason behind that? You know, we're looking at, um, you know, a, a, a fairly risky thing to do. We're raising temperature by a few degrees, but if we get that wrong, then we can have significant effects on cell function. We can have significant changes in the function of organs and potentially even cause the death of the organism. So what's going on here? Well, if you think about this, right, if you think about the sorts of microorganisms that are likely to invade your body, right? So, and if we get back to our body temperature thing, the micro, our body temperature sits between 36.5 degrees, right, and about 37.5 degrees. So if you think about the microorganisms that are going to invade your body, then in order for them to have any chance of replicating and surviving and doing all of the things that they need to do, then they need to function really well at 36 to 37.5 degrees centigrade, right? So this actually becomes a really, um, for some microorganisms, these are their ideal situations. This is exactly what they want. Nice, moist, nutrient-rich environment sitting at 36.5 to 37.5 degrees. It's like a built-in um, incubator for those microorganisms. So it's thought that the idea behind a fever is the evolutionary advantage, the evolutionary drive or push to develop a process that would cause us to raise the set point of our body temperature is that by taking our body temperature up to, let's say 39 to say 40 degrees centigrade, what we do is we shift the maximum temperature outside the ideal range, right? And so now 
we don't have this nice ideal range of body temperature. Microorganisms find it harder to reproduce, they find it harder to divide and harder to thrive. So that's gonna interfere and impair their function, which will be really good. On top of that, as we raise body temperature, just a little bit before we get into significant damage and denaturing of proteins, we'll see an increase in um, a range of biochemical and enzymatic processes that may actually facilitate the role and the function of the immune system. All right. So this, as I said, is a direct effect and it's a direct consequence of the hypothalamus changing the set point, the homeostatic set point. Okay. So let's just quickly, you know, we're getting at like about where are we? About 15 minutes to go before we hit the hour. Um, let's just quickly talk about, you know, a couple of different situations. So let's say that we are looking at a situation where it's a really, really hot day. Hot day, been outside, uh, we're maybe running, let's say we're running a 10K race on a really hot day. Um, and that's causing a significant challenge to our body temperature. So our body temperature is really wanting to elevate, right? And so it's starting to head up. We're starting to move outside of our normal ranges. So if we're looking at our homeostatic levels here, this is our maximum. So we've been doing this and now increasingly starting to move outside of that normal range. And what we obviously wanna do is start to bring it back down to the normal ranges. So what sort of things are we going to be able to do? What sort of effectors are we going to be able to initiate to uh, produce these changes that might uh, allow us to lower our body temperature. Well, really, we can sort of summarize these in, in a few different ways. We can talk about things like autonomic responses. So we can talk about um, particularly changes in the sympathetic nervous system activation. So, if we get significant sympathetic nervous system activation, then we're going to, part of that is we're going to see an increase in the production of sweat, right? So we'll see an activation of the sweat glands and that will place water onto the skin. And through evaporation, which is one way that we can lose, lose heat, evaporation, we're going to cause a reduction and we're going to cause the body to lose heat, right? So the heat is going to disappear away from the body and hopefully that will start to bring our body temperature down. Now those sweat glands and that evaporation needs to happen at the surface of our, um, at the surface of our body. And so as a result, we need to increase the delivery of heat to the surface of our body. And so one way that we can do that is we can increase the vasodilation of the blood vessels supplying the skin. So we're going to see an increase in the amount of blood moving into the skin because that's going to allow the heat to transfer um, into the water that's come out as a result of sweat. And we're going to see a, uh, a loss of heat through evaporation. We'll also see you know, a loss of heat through conduction and convection occurring from the surface of the skin as well. But we need to bring the heat from the the core of the body out to the surface and the point at which our body interacts with the external environment in order to get that heat away. And so the way we're doing that is by vasodilating because most of the heat is carried in the body through the, the bloodstream. So that's one particular, you know, this is one particular mechanism and this explains, we get sweaty, we get really red in the face, our, you know, we get red in the body, uh, as we're sort of seeing a lot of vasodilation, we're seeing a lot more blood brought to the surface. But, you know, there are other things that we can do. And one of the ones that people often sort of forget about when they're talking about changes that would occur to lower heat are behavioral changes. So the hypothalamus doesn't just initiate a whole series of autonomic responses and activate the sympathetic nervous system to cause sweating and vasodilation of the skin, sort of increase the transfer of heat away from the body. It also initiates a whole series of behavioral responses. So what are we talking about when we're talking about behavioral responses? Well, we're talking about things like as simple as, you know, getting out of the sun, stopping running, jumping in a cool 
pool of water, putting the air conditioning on, placing yourself in front of a fan, taking clothes off. You know, these are behavioral responses. These are changes in our behavior that are directed towards lowering our body temperature. This becomes a really interesting topic of conversation when we think about this, because what it actually sort of starts to highlight is how much free will we actually have, right? So, you know, when you're running around and you're really, really, really hot um, and you decide, oh, this is ridiculous and I'm going to go grab a hose and I'm going to sort of douse myself in this nice cold water and cool myself off. The question is, did you choose to do that? Or was that behavior driven by your hypothalamus actively trying to reduce its body temperature. And your conscious perception of that in sort of gave you this sensation and this sense that you were actually choosing to do that action. But in actual fact, that action was determined well before your consciousness got wind of it. And this was actually very much driven by a deeper, older part of the brain that was directed towards lowering your, blood, your body temperature. So I find these, these particularly interesting, these questions about how much do we actually control? You know, what, what are we actually responsible for? When we get thirsty and we take a drink of water and we go to the tap and we pour ourselves a nice cold drink of water and we drink that, did we choose to do that? Or was that osmoreceptors in our body detecting that there were slight changes happening in the ionic concentration of our blood um, and that we needed to increase our intake of water? And that's what actually drove that response. So let's do the converse then. What's gonna happen on a really cold day? So on a really cold day, you know, we're standing out, let's say it's, you know, let's say, let's go really cold, minus 20 degrees centigrade, really cold, we're outside, we're not wearing enough clothing, um, and we're starting to see a significant drop in our body temperature. So what are the sorts of things that we could initiate to do that? Well, again, we could have, you know, a whole collection of autonomic responses. We'll go through those. We could have a whole collection of behavioral responses start thinking about what some of those might be. But we'll also have some endocrine responses in there as well. All right, we'll talk about some of those. So if we talk about our autonomic responses, what sort of things are we going to potentially see? Well, we'll see instead of vasodilation, we'll see vasoconstriction. All right, so we'll see a constriction of the blood vessels to the surface of the body, because the last thing we want to do is be losing more heat. We're trying to maintain heat and we're trying to sort of keep that heat closer to our organs where the enzymes are and where all of the, the cells that are really responsible for keeping um, our body systems functioning are located. So we wanna maintain the heat closer to the core of the body. And so that vasoconstriction is gonna limit heat loss and, and keep the, uh, the heat closer to the body. We also might see shivering. All right, so shivering is repetitive activity of the uh, the muscles um, and that's going to cause a uh, the generation of heat so as the muscles contract they generate heat and so we'll see an increase in heat responses um, what other things will we see we will see also activation of erector pili muscles so we'll actually see um, what do we say goosebumps right and the raising of hairs, right? So raising of hair on the skin. So the raising of hair on the skin um, is actually going to create an opportunity to trap a layer of air, a thin layer of air over the surface of the skin that's gonna act like an insulator and it's going to reduce the, the ability for uh, convection and conduction and evaporation to take place. And again, reduce the loss of heat that we're gonna see from the surface of our body. Right, so there are just some of the things that we could potentially initiate that would help us to maintain our body heat. But what about behaviorally, right? So what could we do behaviorally? Well, it's as simple as, you know, put some more clothes on, um, stand in, you know, put on the heater, you know, lots of lots of things. Go inside, move to another country, maybe that's a longer term behavioral effect, right? But we could certainly see that there's a whole range of different behaviors that again are going to be very much directed towards increasing our core body temperature. Um, and again, you can think about, you know, when you're really, really cold and you run inside to put on uh, the heater and stand in front of the heater and put your, um, put a nice tracksuit on, 
is that actually you choosing to do that or is that your hypothalamus? When it's cold in terms of the external factors, says Likusha, I hope I've said that right, um, can heat input only occur through conduction and radiation? When it's cold in terms of external factors, can heat input only occur through conduction and radiation? Um, yes, I believe so. And it's probably, yeah, so yes, I would say yes. Um, I can't think what other ways are you thinking that heat could be put into the body. Um, I mean, we're certainly not going to see evaporation um, adding heat to the body. So uh, we're really kind of looking at conduction and radiation happening there. Yeah, I think that's probably the, the answer to that question. Um, if we're talking about internal factors, though, um, you know, we've talked about this vasoconstriction, the shivering. Um, one of the things, and it's sort of related to, I don't know how I got that one. Oh, no. What did I do? Hang on, inspect, go away. Hang on. There we go, okay. So one of the things that can happen is through sympathetic nervous system activation, it's actually an autonomic response. Um, and this is uh, what they call uh, non-shivering thermogenesis. So what this relates to is that inside your body, there are, there's actually white adipose tissue, which is very much your lipid storage supply. But then there is actually particular types of adipose tissue called brown adipose tissue. Um, and these are not located everywhere. There's a very large brown adipose tissue fat pad at the back of the neck, for instance, right? So brown adipose tissue is thermogenic. Um, and it responds to sympathetic nervous system activation and it responds to autonomic nervous system activation. Um, and when it's stimulated, it basically burns fat like a furnace. And so you end up producing a lot of heat from this brown adipose tissue. And so not only can we vasoconstrict and not only can we shiver to generate some more energy just through the contraction of muscles, but we have the ability to tap into this brown adipose tissue and get this brown adipose tissue to generate heat through this thermogenic effect of metabolizing and breaking down fat tissue. So this has become a really important player um, in not just you know body temperature control, but also uh, in regulation of obesity and, and lots of different things, right? In terms of how, do we, how can we potentially harness this brown adipose tissue sort of increase our metabolic rate, increase our body temperature, for instance. So, um, so that's another way that we can do it. The other thing that we can do, and it's sort of related to our brown adipose tissue, we can see endocrine responses. And so, you know, things like noradrenaline during release during stress, and again, glucocorticoids released during stress are going to do things across this whole range of things to change behavior, change the autonomic system, but they're also going to stimulate the metabolic pathways um, inside cells that we talked about at the beginning where we were talking about the breakdown of fats and proteins and glucose to produce energy. And we talked about just a little while ago that about 40% of that goes into the production of energy and about 60% comes out of heat. So if I can stimulate those pathways, if I can increase the activity of those pathways, then I can produce more heat and I can maintain uh, and try to get my body temperature back into a normal value again. Um, and this is one of the reasons why, you know, if you're living in a cold environment, you know, it provides a significant um, drain on your energy reserves, you know. So if you live for a very long period of time in a very cold environment, you need to ingest a lot more calories than someone living in a hotter environment. Um, and so, uh, so that, you know, and that is largely because, you know, we're st we need to stimulate those metabolic pathways harder to generate the heat that we need to maintain our, our core body temperature. So look, I think at this point, we're just about to hit the five o'clock mark. Um, I am pretty much tapped out on what I can tell you um, at my particular level um, about thermogenesis and metabolic rate control and, and, and how these things are linking together. I've tried to make this interesting for you or hopefully I've been able to sort of highlight some things that you didn't know and maybe give you some interesting tidbits and trivia that you can um, also tell your friends and family about. Um, 
I will hang around for a little bit longer and see if there are any specific questions. Um, Jamie's left, so I don't really actually know who's out there anymore. I can, I know that there were at least two people here um, because they put some put some messages on the chat group. But um, if you're happy to ask some questions, and please ask some questions or uh, let me know whether you enjoyed the stream. If not, um, I will end up calling this to a close and we will catch you again next week so i'll hang around online here for another maybe 10 or 15 or 20 seconds to see whether anything pops up on the chat group if not i will hit the stream ending button and we will bring the stream to a close um, again thank you very much for participating thank you very much for listening in um, this is something that Jamie uh, particularly has put a lot of time and energy in setting up and uh, we're both really hoping that this will become something that uh, we see as being a real, you know, that you will enjoy and that will become a real support for people, not just in our program, but also um, in other programs across the world and, you know, even high school students and, and just general people who are just generally interested uh, and want to know a bit more about how the body actually functions. Okay, so um, it doesn't appear as though there's much more going on, so I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will catch up with you in the next stream. Thanks very much. Bye, everyone. <laughs>